opening of our webinar. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, really very nice to count with such an international audience today. Um, from the Center of Latin America Studies and Documentation at the University of Amsterdam, I want to welcome you all to this webinar on demilitarization and independence in Costa Rica and in Latin America. Um, a special welcome to our distinguished speakers and discussants and to the ambassador. My name is Barbara Hogenboom. I am a professor of Latin American studies of SETLA and it's my great pleasure to chair today's meeting. Um, especially for three reasons. Uh, the important topic of demilitarization, of course, uh, while in theory uh, considered to be peacekeepers and protectors against foreign uh, interference in practice, Latin America's political past and presence um, uh, has seen that military often harm uh, democracy and human rights. So there's a difficult relation there. Drawing lessons uh, today from the exceptional experience of Costa Rica with the abolition of the armed forces since more than 70 years now is not only academically relevant, but also politically and socially important for the region. Uh, second, this webinar is special because of the memorable uh, moment. This year, Costa Rica celebrates 200 years of independence and just nine, nine days ago on the 15th of September, together with Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, excuse me, uh, Costa Rica celebrated the uh, 20th anniversary of the Act of Central American Independence. So I want to congratulate all Central Americans in our audience with this Bicentenario. And then third, um, this webinar is also special because of the distinguished and excellent speakers of today. Uh, it is really an honor to count with former president of Costa Rica, uh, Dr. Luis Guillermo. Solis Rivera as our keynote speaker. Four years ago, we had the pleasure uh, to meet um, when during uh, your presidential uh, working visit to the Netherlands, uh, you gave a most interesting lecture about climate change and inclusive development uh, in the auditorium of, uh, of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, but that was for a, a selected um, audience. It is wonderful to meet again uh, and to count with our two discussants who are both key experts on topics of violence, military and politics and society in Latin America. Professor Dirk Kruid from Utrecht University and uh, Professor Kees Konings of uh, also Utrecht University and SETLA at the University of Amsterdam. But I'm also pleased that we can now have a wider audience also in different parts of the world uh, learning from uh, your ideas and and your uh, yeah your very insightful way of talking about Costa Rica's past uh, presence and also future. Before passing the word to Dr. Solis, uh, first the ambassador of Costa Rica in the Netherlands, the Honorable Arnaldo uh, Brenes Castro, will say a few opening words. Mr. Berenice Castro himself is also an expert in human rights and peace and security affairs and has served the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 20 years. Dear Ambassador, thank you so much for this pleasant and uh, fluent collaboration on, on, the, on the webinar and uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Barbara Hohebon. Um, for the Embassy of Costa Rica in the Netherlands, it is really a great honor to have joint efforts with SEDLA to organize this webinar. And many thanks as well to Dr. Julien Weigels, um, to Gaia Nikolsky, and to the Jose Figueres Museum from Costa Rica for all the logistic support. And of course, to professors Case Kunings and Dirk Klautz for having agreed to serve as discussants. And our sincere gratitude to former President Luis Guillermo Solis for having accepted our invitation to give today's keynote presentation. As you all know, this month, Costa Rica is celebrating its independence bicentennial. When we were thinking of ways to celebrate it, we wanted to have an educational event focused on a particular trait that characterizes Costa Rica. My country, of course, has a long tradition in protection of the environment and promotion of human rights, democracy, and multilateralism, among others. But there is one characteristic that makes us Costa Ricans feel especially proud. That is the absence of armed forces. 
And indeed, Costa Rica's experience in this regard is particularly interesting, notably considering that the abolition of the armed forces took place during the first years of the Cold War and in a time when armed conflicts between and within states were not uncommon. So Costa Rica's decision to abolish its armed forces would have seemed contrary to the logic of the times. And in many ways, such a decision helped to forge the destiny of our country and the character of its people. It also contributed to the economy by saving resources, thereby having a positive impact on other areas such as education and health services. Having no recourse to the use of the armed forces as an instrument to exercise power, the Costa Rican political class had at hand only the political tools that the democratic system affords to defend particular ideological views, thus serving to consolidate democracy and the rule of law. And Costa Rica's demilitarization, of course, also meant a great contribution towards regional peace and stability. Clearly, a country with no armed forces cannot pose a threat to its neighbors. In the context of the decade of the 1980s, when there were civil wars in three of the five Central American countries, the political and social stability of Costa Rica served as an anchor that helped to negotiate the 1987 peace accords, which effectively served to end those wars. In sum, there are many interesting lessons that can be drawn from Costa Rica's experience becoming a demilitarized country. With this in mind, it is my great honor to present former Costa Rican President Luis Guillermo Solis, our keynote speaker. Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera, professor, diplomat, and politician. Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera served as president of Costa Rica from 2014 to 2018. Prior to his election, he was a professor, researcher, director of the Central American Master's Program in Political Science, as well as deputy director of the School of Political Science and associate dean of the School of Social Sciences at the University of Costa Rica. He also worked at the Costa Rica Ministry of Foreign Affairs as chief of staff to the minister, and later as ambassador at large for Central American Affairs and director general for foreign policy. Between 2009 and 2012, he was representative of the Ibero-American General Secretary for Central American and Haiti. In 2016, he was appointed co-chair of the UN Secretary General High-Level Panel on the Economic Empowerment of Women. Former President Solis is a graduate of the University of Costa Rica and has a master's degree in history and political science from Tulane University. With 30 years as an educator, he has also taught uni universities, universities throughout the US and Europe. And in 1999, was a Fulbright Scholar, Florida International University. He has published extensively in books and professional journals on US Latin American relations and Central American history and politics. Professor Solis holds Dr. Honoris Causa degrees from Korean, Chinese, French, US, and Costa Rica universities for his leadership in championing women's equality, human rights, peace, and international law throughout the world. He is currently interim director and professor at the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center of the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs of the Florida International University. Professor Luis Guillermo Solis, the floor is yours. Good morning to all. Thank you very much, uh, dear Mr. Ambassador. I would like to thank all the people who have been involved in organizing this event. Uh, Professor Hagenboom, thank you so much for allowing the, uh, re the, the Center for Latin America Research uh, and Documentation and our distinguished Present uh, commentators, professors Kennings and Krecht. I am most uh, honored by their presence here. I also want to uh, greet uh, 
Madam uh, Ana Maria Oduber, who was with, with Ambassador Brenes, uh, a driving force in this event. And then obviously all the people both at CEDLA and at the embassy who have been working so hard for many months, bringing us together. My greeting extends to all the participants in this forum uh, with whom I uh, wish to have a dialogue at once. I make my remarks that I will try to keep as short as possible. Uh, as it has been already mentioned, Central America is celebrating 200 years of independence in, in, 19, in 2021. And uh, this is a, a good moment to reflect upon the region and the contributions that one of its countries, Costa Rica, made in 1948 when it decided to abolish its armed forces and some of the lessons that have been learned throughout the, that time. Um, for my country, uh, the abolition of the, of, of the armed forces is not another important historical event as many others uh, in, in the course of our development. Uh, it represents the unilateral and voluntary relation, uh, decision, adoption of a way of life, uh, a form of, of political organization and, 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 and the organization of power that defies conventional wisdom. It is also uh, an exceptional action that, as it was mentioned by Ambassador Brenes, happened at the beginning of the Cold War and after our, first la our last civil war in 1948. Therefore, um, I think it's very relevant to talk about this. I mean, I obviously, I, I don't want to, to appear too, uh, uh, too anxious to uh, uh, Proselytate, to proselytate in, in, uh, on, on behalf of Costa Rica, but uh, I, I'm very proud of this. And I think uh, it provides uh, some material for thought in the current international arena. There are four things that I would like to discuss today with you, four questions that I'm going to address. Why was the abolition of the armed forces possible in Costa Rica would be the first. Why has it been successful that's the second one. Which are the benefits that Costa Rica has obtained by abolishing its armed forces? That's the third the one. And finally, can this policy be replicated in other places? Is it convenient and likely to happen? So those are the four questions that I, I would like to, to address. And, 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 and I will begin by talking about why was it possible? And the truth of the matter is uh, that just as it was the case with the other members of the Kingdom of Guatemala during the colonial period under Spanish rule, Costa Rica had a local militia to protect itself uh, from the attacks mainly uh, of uh, irregular forces, pirates, um, some of them financed or all of them financed by, by Great Britain. Uh, this was, and, and obviously prior to that of the indigenous groups that objected the presence of Spanish, of Spanish colonists. Truth of the matter is that both, uh, for one reason or the other, those militias uh, that began being Spanish uh, would eventually become locally recruited and locally maintained. And given the poverty of the overall colonial uh, settings in Costa Rica, they were, um, they were weak from the very beginning. It was different from the ones in, in Guatemala and other places, not because they were extraordinarily stronger than the Costa Rican ones, but simply because their challenges were larger and they had more to protect, whereas our country was not, not that, that significant strategic terms as others in, in the region. With independence in 1821, this scheme was maintained throughout uh, the federal period and up until 1839, in other words, almost 20 years. Uh, it was uh, highly politicized and those, those armies became separated just as the political system became separated between bands of conservatives on the one hand and liberals on the other hand. Uh, the only difference between them being the band around their hats the liberals using a red band and the conservatives using a blue uh, band, but basically these were peasants. And, and we underwent an, uh, in, in, in Central America, a period of, of extreme turbulence after independence with a lot of civil wars being fought between uh, the, the countries that lean towards liberalism and those who wanted to be conservative. The Axis uh, 
pivoted between Guatemala, the former head of the Kingdom of Guatemala, the Audiencia de Guatemala, and um, the Kingdom of Guatemala, uh, which was conservative, and then the two more liberal countries of Central America at the time, El Salvador and Honduras, and obviously the figure of Francisco Morazán uh, being the most relevant of, of those characters in that time against Cabrera in Guatemala. Uh, but when, the, the, when the, the, the Federation finally came to an end and dissolved in 1839, those militias uh, became incipient armies, armies and national armies, and, uh, and they kept on being you know, fundamentally very uh, backward and weak. A turning po point in the region uh, was reached uh, between 1855 and 1860. Uh, some of you may recall, those who have studied Central American history, that at that time, Central America was invaded by a band of filibusters, or we would call them mercenaries, that uh, came from the United States under the leadership of a journalist and doctor called William Walker, who wanted to adhere Central America very much in the fashion that was uh, popular at a time, following the example of Texas and California, of privateers taking territories and then joining them to the United States in a process that we uh, now know form part of this greater vision of, uh, of an expanding United States, which at the time was still you know, in, the, in the epochs of formation, this early Republican uh, times. Um, the, 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 the war that ensued uh, as a result of that invasion, which led Walker to become president of Nicaragua, believe it or not, um, implied a, a, a second battle, which was not as visible, but it had to do with the United States and Great Britain pushing back and forth for the control over the River San Juan, which is the current border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua, uh, the Lake San Juan and the Isthmus of Rivas, which had become the first version, let's put it that way, of the Panama Canal. And it was very important at the time because it was the only way to move fast between the East Coast of the United States and the West Coast. But it was also a trading point that had been very important since colonial times. And the British was very, were very important to, um, were, were very interested in controlling it. So basically Costa Rica sided with the British, uh, Nicaragua sided with, uh, with Walker. And, um, in the ultimate analysis, siding with Great Britain allowed Costa Rica for the first time to, to receive military support from, from the British. And this meant not only weapons, uh, a significant amount, not, not the, the you know, big weapons, but, but mini rifles, uh, mini being the name of the rifle, uh, not mini in the size of the rifle, uh, and trainers particularly trainers, uh, among them some Polish uh, trainers. But it was an army of peasants, however. And once the, uh, they were able to defeat Walker in 1856, uh, and after controlling the region uh, up until 1860, when he was finally, Walker was finally captured uh, in, in Omoa, in Honduras, and, and executed, the, the Costa Rican army was, was significant. The, the only bad thing that happened, well, the many things, bad things happened at that time, but one of the, the worst part, ha things happening was uh, uh, that the Costa Rican forces that were fighting in Nicaragua brought back to Costa Rica cholera morbus, a big pandemic that killed 10% of our population. So the army was never able to consolidate too much. Um, and in fact, the most important uh, efforts to create a modern armed force came at the uh, outcome of the liberal state around the 1870s. At that point, the Costa Rican economy, based on coffee, had created an oligarchy that, uh, that decided to, to build an armed force. And there was a significant amount of money devoted to this. Even we bought some, some, some ships. There was an, a navy and, uh, that, was, um, uh, that, that was initiated. And we received support from, from European nations at this time, the 1870s, the United States is still very much trying to recuperate from the, from the Civil War. And therefore, the dominant influences uh, on Central American politics came from Europe. 
uh, the United States was still not an, an emerging power. A few years later, it is going to happen. But, uh, but as, as it was the case with previous experiences, not even this, uh, the creation of an armed force, which was, you know, constitutionally um, uh, supported, it was the, the armed forces were, were present in the Constitution of 1871, uh, was not um, as articulated as it was in other countries. For example, Costa Rica did not receive the missions of Chilean uh, or German military uh, uh, personnel, which also that, which came to El Salvador and to Guatemala almost at the same time. So by 1948, when last civil war occurs in Costa Rica, the National Army was still very weak, was still very bad, badly trained, was ill-equipped uh, by regional standards, and therefore was not a um, significant factor of power within the country. Uh, the Civil War in 1948 was, was short but bloody, uh, with the rebels using what I would call basically non-military weaponry uh, that they have received from, from, from Guatemala. Uh, the National Army was, was again, very weak. It, it had to be reinforced by militias levied uh, by its allies from the banana plantations, mostly communist caters, Leva, levied from uh, to defend the, the social guarantees that the rebels were said to oppose. So, you know, one, one, one army, the, the one that was protecting the government and the other army that was fighting against it, who won, ultimately won the civil war, were basically, again, armies that were formed by locals, trained by locals with very bad and old equipment. Uh, so, it is, it is noteworthy that throughout this whole period, there was not so such, such thing in Costa Rica as a, as a very structured military establishment. This is not to say that we didn't have military, because we did, but they did not develop into a, a supreme institution of, of national power. And I think that has to do with the fact that in Costa Rica, the elites uh, ruled and uh, at the same time handled, ruled the country and were the uh, administrators of it. In other words, not only were they powerful to control the economy, but they also exercised the function of government. Whereas in other countries of Central America, the armed forces substituted the civilian elites in ruling the countries, which, which is a, a very significant difference in the case of Costa Rica. So once the last civil war ended, uh, the victorious army, uh, which was again formed mostly by non-military personnel, March to the, to the capital city of San Jose. They looked martial, uh, well poised and, and clothed, but were armed with light uh, infantry weaponry and still lacking the structure of professional armed forces. Uh, they were disbanded uh, soon after uh, by a de facto military junta, uh, military and civilian junta that ruled the country for 18 months. And then the president of that junta, uh, Don Pepe Figueres, Jose Figueres, the victorious general of the Civil War, announced the abolition of the armed forces on 1st December 1948. The junta promoted the creation of a constitutional assembly, which met with a majority of deputies not being followers of Figueres, but from other political parties. And, uh, and they incorporated Figueres' abolition of 1948 into the 1949 Constitution. Twice after that date, in 1949 and 1955, Costa Rica was invaded by the losing parties of the Civil War with support from Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza. In both instances, the United States supported Costa Rica. And in fact, the regional uh, treaty of um, the Inter-American Treaty uh, of reciprocal assistance that had been signed in 1947 was used in the in the invasion to protect Costa Rica. Uh, it, it, it was a, a very important thing because the, the Rio Pact, as it is also called, was for the first time applied precisely to defend a country that had surrendered its armed forces. So the, the, the abolition of the army in Costa Rica has been constitutionally granted. Uh, Article 12 of the Constitution establishes the term of that um, 
of, of that abolition. And allow me to, to quote, uh, the army is prohibited as a permanent institution for the vigilance and preservation of public order. The country will have police forces, the, the necessary police forces. This is a very loose uh, concept of necessary police forces, only by continental bylaws or for the national defense could military forces be organized. Military and defense forces will always be subordinate to civilian power. They will not be able to deliberate nor to express or declare uh, anything on an individual or collective way. So why was it possible for Figueres to abolish the armed forces in the context of the Cold War and in the, at the end of a civil war? First of all, because of the historical weakness of military institutions from the colonial period on. And uh, I would like to, to mention also seven more uh, six more conditions. The limited need for a large army, uh, in, 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 you know, differently from other parts of the world, world, Central America is not a highly strategic region, uh, except for one factor, which is its uh, location between the east and the west, the north and the south, and obviously the passage that many countries have wanted to control, which is represented by the Panama Canal. Uh, but this, this, this factor was very much con under the control of the hegemonic power, the United States, because of the way in which the canal was built. And the, 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 the law, the constitutional granted chapter of the Panamanian constitution, giving the Panama Canal Zone to the United States for, um, for 100 years. So the Americans could protect it without needing uh, the neighbors of the Panama Canal to partake of that. The overall poverty of republic, armies are very expensive. And therefore, when you, when you are poor, like we were, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to fund an army when you have other priorities. The leadership of Figueres and the vision of Figueres. Uh, some others uh, have talked about it, about abolishing the armed forces. Uh, we are, they are on the record, but it was Figueres who actually did it. And I think that uh, leadership remains a very fundamental part of politics. Another reason was the availability of alternative defensive uh, mechanisms, both domestic uh, as well as international. And one of the good things that Figueres um, imagined was the armed forces being somehow substituted by local institutions that could provide credibility and legitimacy to the, to the government. Those institutions being um, for example, the, the uh, Tribunal of Elections, and we'll see others, Tribunal of Elections, the General Controller's Office, a number of, of local ones that, 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 that upheld the legitimacy of democratic uh, of rule, and the international ones, of course, those created by the OES and the United Nations, including the International Court of Justice. And this circumstance gradually developed what we could call a civic anti-militaristic culture. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that's ingrained in the Costa Rican character. So, you know, we are very critical and we do all sorts of, we have all sorts of expressions against politicians and, and, and governments and all of sort, but very few people imagine that we will solve those grievances through military means. So there is an ingrained, uh, gradual growth of this sensitivity against militarism that is very well uh, captured in a phrase by the philanthrop the Japanese philanthropist Keinishi Sasakawa when he said, blessed is the Costa Rican mother who knows upon giving birth that her child will never grow to be a soldier. This, this, I think it's a very powerful statement of how this political understanding um, happens. And then uh, the resistance of the authorities uh, of Costa Rica throughout many years uh, to those who have been trying to suggest the creation of an army. This happened during the Central American Wars that uh, Ambassador Brenes alluded to. So that was one thing. Um, 
we we resisted that. And and the, the one who articulated it more publicly was uh, the the government of the United States under the Reagan administration. And for, okay, so uh, go, moving now to has, why has it been su successful? And the success of demilitarization in Costa Rica uh, has to do with the institutionalization of public affairs, most particularly the creation and development of four sets of institutions uh, that, that I find important. The administration of justice, including the police, political and financial control, electoral administration and human progress. And allow me just to be very brief uh, defining them. The administration of justice, it has to do with the efficiency of our judiciary. Uh, if the justice system is seriously deficient, lacks credibility and legitimacy, it's in, incapable of securing the rule of law or is hampered by extra judiciary factors leading to its over politicization, then it is impossible to have uh, a solid democratic civilian state. Uh, secondly, on political and financial control, the, the constitution of 1949 and other successive reforms um, allowed for new safeguards and political uh, financial control institution, the increased po uh, power of the legislative, the creation of the general controller's office and its ecosystem and Later the, later, the office of the ombudsman are all part of that logic of creating institutions that will allow for internal controls and the strengthening of local of local uh, political institution. Most fundamentally, electoral administration. Uh, Costa Rica has had a tremendous developing in electoral administration from the very onset in 1949, and that has allowed elections to become very uh, certified or certifiable, uh, uh, clean and transparent. The creation of the Supreme Tribunal of Election, which has become a virtual fourth power of the Republic was essential. The National Registry of Citizens, which provides the identification cards. Uh, so uh, it's, it's so strong that the Tribunal of Election becomes the chief of the police force during the election, election campaign. And then human progress. And this is probably the most important of it all. The corner store, corner store of internal peace in Costa Rica, it's, 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 it's social infrastructure built around the social security system, which was incorporated in the constitution in, in 1942. And what, what was, I think, one of the reasons why the last civil war was fought, because they want, the, 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 the powerful elites in Costa Rica didn't want it to. So all of this, I think, uh, allows to to understand why it was able to maintain it. And what were the benefits? Allow me to mention just briefly six, financial. The money that could have been invested in the military was diverted for human uh, causes. Two, political. Not having an army provides uh, uh, factors of stability as well. Uh, judiciary impedes the creation of, of separate normative jurisdictions that the military generally have and ensures the equality before the law of every citizen. Geopolitical, it has been said already, allows the country to claim neutrality uh, in the context of neighboring armed conflicts and legitimate uh, resort to the instruments of international law, which we've done. There's, uh, there are civic benefits, uh, upholding the supremacy of peace, pluralism, the rule of law, democracy, democratic rule, uh, the respect of human rights, uh, it's, it's very important because it upholds the, import, the, the, the priority that we provide to international law. And then it's also very symbolic. Uh, some countries are very proud of having armed forces because these armed forces uh, are associated to the birth of, of the national state. In Costa Rica, it has become a national brand of our country as well. Let me finish by talking about the possibility of replic replicating um, this, this model of non-military uh, established, of a non-military state. It has been attempted in Panama and, uh, and Haiti, uh, but mostly in unsuccessful uh, ways. Uh, and the resistance for the uh, replication of this 
uh, model comes from within and also from, um, from without. External threats and internal weaknesses are usually invoked to prevent this, the effective compliance with the constitutional texts. So in both countries, technically there's not an air armed force, but um, it is much to be said about the substitution of the original armed forces into new types of them. So I would like to, to answer the question if, about uh, the replication with resounding yes, uh, because the benefits are obvious. I think it, it has worked for us, it could work for other countries, but I don't think it is likely to happen you know, um, uh, to in, in, the, in the near future, to see this as a generalized factor in international affairs. Uh, and these challenges arise from security concerns, from historical, economic, geopolitical uh, concerns. And, uh, you know, there are areas in which obviously you can make a case for the need of armies. So uh, the markets of war and fear are were well and, and, and healthy in our world. Um, it's very profitable, it's very attractive. Dem dem demilitarization is bad business for what Eisenhower called the industrial military complex. Um, many countries uh, would object to it because it's, it's a bad example, and yet we've been able to keep it. Um, and, um, and obviously, when you're talking of uh, some deals, like the one we've seen developing in the uh, between United States, Australia, and Great Britain, you know, talking about $70 billion, $8 billion. We're into that kind of, uh, uh, of, of, um, of money. It's, you, can, you can very easily imagine why it is that uh, some forces would object to, to having it. So in conclusion, demilitariz de dem demilitarization has been very positive for Costa Rica. Uh, its benefits have extended for 70, more than 70 years, 73 years and it's an extraordinary patrimony to future generations. Um, it is also, the demilitarization is probably the, the most important factor, uh, or at least a decisive factor uh, for the country's democratic development and stability. Uh, and it's actually a very convenient thing. Um, it has become, as I mentioned before, um, uh, a cultural factor. Uh, it's not a tactical matter anymore. Now it forms part of our national uh, well-being, a factor of prosperity. And while it will be probably very difficult to replicate the Costa Rican experience in other countries and regions, uh, the possibility there needs to be analyzed. I remember once a very distinguished Israeli scholar uh, mentioned the like the, the 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 why it would be interesting to to seek for a demilitarized Palestinian state, for example, so that Israel would not have any excuse not to grant that state its territory and admit it as a, um, as a partner and as a neighbor. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, walked too far, but it's one of the examples of, of discussions that we could have regarding this issue. At any rate, I hope that uh, others will follow suit. And even if that is not the case, then you still have the luminous example of Costa Rica that is there to be learned from, from many more than those who are here today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guillermo Solis. Very clear and uh, without any PowerPoint. Um, thank you for this uh, very interesting overview, especially also that history I wasn't so aware of, and I think it's always important to have that um, in the back of our mind uh, to know where certain developments came from. Um, yes, as I said, we have two discussants today, um, two professors from, uh, from the Netherlands who have written themselves quite a bit on um, violence, on military, on also civil wars um, uh, in Latin America. Um, so we will ask uh, each of them to share some uh, thoughts regarding your presentation, but also a bit from, from their research and maybe also making some connections to other uh, countries in the region. Um, and then later on, we will open the floor for a discussion with uh, the audience. 
Um, so let me just already tell you, because now some of you who are listening may have already in your mind a particular question uh, for um, Dr. Solis. Um, please uh, wait a bit, but you can already in the chat just type the topic of your question. You don't have to put the whole question there, um, but you can already put the topic there and then we can start collecting some questions for the discussion later on. Um, let me see, um, Dirk Kruid, Professor Kruid, I think we'll start first, right? No, Kees Konings? Kees. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure uh, what would be yes, the order. Yes, because we, we, we made a division and uh, I will start off with some general uh, and also historical comments uh, and questions and then Dirk will follow on with uh, some reflections on the more contemporary a military in a, in a number of countries, if you are okay with that, everybody. Yes, of course. <laughs> so first, first of all, thank you very much to Setland, to the Costa Rican Embassy for inviting us and including us in this event. And of course, to President Solis. Uh, uh, for his uh, really an honor to be in the company of such an outstanding uh, scholar diplomat and of course politician. So uh, we're very happy to, to, to contribute uh, to this. Uh, there's no doubt, uh, I think that Costa Rica presents a unique experience of democratic stability based on what we would like to call radical demilitarization in a region in which the phenomenon of political armies, armies that are in domestic politics, has been dominant and at times even embark on a similar course or were forced to do so. With the exception of Costa Rica, Panama and Haiti, all of these other states have less than half a million inhabitants. I think a website I uh, consulted counted 36 official uh, nations or states without a military. They are tiny, many are islands and a fair number are not fully sovereign. Panama and Haiti uh, demilitarized by imposition, uh, sort, sort of after having been invaded by the United States and in the Haitian case, a long lasting multilateral UN stability force led by Brazil was deployed to face the proliferation of armed actors and chronic violence. So I fully concur, uh, or we, I think, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Solis' uh, assessment that Costa Rica stands alone as a sovereign nation that abolished its military and not only did that, but also built a stable democracy, an effective state, and relatively peaceful and cohesive society. Uh, in effect, uh, in uh, 1980, emergence of uh, a political army becoming a permanent factor in domestic politics and hence a problem for democracy. I sorry, think, uh, Professor uh, Konings, sorry yes? to interrupt you, but sometimes your connection, you freeze and then <laughs> Zoom catches up, but then you're talking at a very high speed. Is there anything you can improve? Yes, about I, I, uh, sorry for this. I have some connectivity problems in my new house. The way I can solve it is go to the living room where my signal is stronger. So uh, for the sake of uh, quality, I think I do that. So it will cost me like 30 seconds to do that. Yes, and I think it's, I, it's- I apologize for that. It's okay but it's probably better so everyone can yeah. follow your, your words. <laughs> I have to kick out my wife from the living room. <laughs> <laughs> the connection there is very bad. They cannot hear. Okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> so I hope the problem is solved now. Let me go to my notes. Mm. Let's... Don't have to apologize. So, uh, so um, uh, I think uh, Dr. Solis gave us a very uh, perceptive and in-depth and insight account of how this happened, and what it's meant, it meant historically and for our present time. So, I like these reflections, among other things, on uh, replicability. Uh, uh, it would be a nice if uh, there would be other countries next to Costa Rica that stand as a proud sovereign nation without military, living in peace uh, and democracy. Um, 
I also was triggered, uh, something you did not mention that much in, in this talk, but we saw some notes beforehand that you were uh, so graceful to, to forward to us. Uh, the importance of demilitarization in relation to national identity and the self-definition of the Costa Rican nation as peaceful. Um, and as has already been mentioned also by uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, uh, this has been matched by the decades long efforts of the Costa Rican government to promote peace, democracy and human rights. We all know that. And Costa Rica also has always been a very important partner in this for, for instance, the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Having said all this, I will attempt a brief re regional contextualization of this Costa Rican experience of radical demilitarization by taking five elements of interest from Dr. Solis' lecture and link these to a few questions before I give it over to, to my friend uh, Dirk Kruid. The first point would be the historical experience of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, it was a period of professionalization of the military across Latin America with uh, European missions mostly coming to, to the assistance and across Latin America, this also laid the foundation for political militarism and the political armies, as we call them. And then this process was deepened by the inclusion of the military institution in most other Latin American countries as a semi-autonomous stakeholder in the cycle of what Alain Touraine calls the period of national popular development, roughly between the 1920s and the 1950s. Uh, not so in Costa Rica. You, of course, uh, gave some explanation, but uh, I'm uh, triggered by it and would like to, uh, to see if you could elaborate a little bit more. What explains this exceptionality? Uh, the National Army remained weak, you say, but why? And even so, weak armies in poor countries elsewhere in the region or elsewhere, for instance, in Africa, have proved perfectly capable to become political. So maybe something more uh, can be said about that. The second point, during the Cold War, most Latin American nations experienced the institutional politicization of its military, in which the institutional expansion of the military mission met with the interests of social groups, mostly but not always conservative politicians, elite sectors and urban middle classes. And this then led to the establishment of the infamous prolonged civil military dictatorships uh, uh, in uh, Guillermo O'Donnell's words, bureaucratic authoritarian regimes. Of course, this did not happen uh, because the, the military was proscribed uh, by law and in the constitution. As you explained quite clearly, uh, Don Pepe, Jose Figueres, uh, emerged victorious from the brief 1948 armed conflict, yet he not only resisted transforming his army or his followers into a foundation for uh, his political rule, but he also managed, or maybe the entire political class and their constituents did manage, to forge a consensus about demilitarization, pledging commitment to civil democracy and quickly making it constitutional. So uh, I would be curious to hear a little bit more about how did this happen after this short, but as you said, bloody uh, civil war that apparently uh, had a deep impact uh, on everybody involved. Uh, how was such a bold move uh, the move of demilitarization possible apart from Don Pepe's insights and foresight. Where institutional stability, administrative effectiveness and democratic civil culture part of the pre-existing necessary conditions or would they rather be a result of successful demilitarization as you also explained, of course. The third point, uh, and I'll become a little bit briefer is uh, and it's also fascinating, you mentioned that the sustained demilitarization was made possible, among other things, by support uh, from the United States and the Organization of American States, offering geopolitical uh, security guarantees to Costa Rica. Uh, um, the question here would be, has this always been a secure arrangement? And of course, uh, as uh, president, you have been at, at the summit of uh, how this is managed and how this was uh, possible. Was it a secure guarantee for Costa Rica, not only in geopolitical terms, but also in terms of popular acceptance of this and uh, national perceptions and debates on sovereignty? And that would be uh, 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 interesting because elsewhere in Latin America, uh, the military, despite this history of uh, uh, dictatorship, are still among the most trusted public institutions. And we know that uh, the military in countries such as uh, Peru, 
Brazil, uh, even Colombia and Chile, uh, to name but a few, are still important in terms of how the nation and national sovereignty is conceived. So how would that be in, in Costa Rica? Would, what would be the sources of this self-identification of uh, being a non-military nation? And fourthly, uh, uh, a post-authoritarian uh, uh, element uh, in Latin America, uh, uh, after democratic transitions and consolidation uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, we see that uh, the domestic role of the military beyond their core uh, uh, mission of territorial defense against foreign threats has been quite persistent, uh, despite differences among uh, countries here. This is in part related to post-authoritarian mission creep, uh, like civic action and new administrative tasks, but also related to new uh, national, uh, regional, and global concerns with security, such as organized crime, drug trafficking, the post-911 war on terror, migration and human mobility, cyber threats, just to name a few. So I, I would be curious to hear in what way such concerns have been a factor in domestic debates in Costa Rica. And how did this relate to uh, uh, the acceptance of the absence of a national military? And finally, uh, if we look at the present conjuncture in the region, Latin American democracies again seems to be under siege and beset by problems, many problems such as corruption, crime, violence, lack of public trust, uh, growing social inequality, etc. Uh, and in this context, there seems to be a recent trend for Latin America and military institutions to reclaim a role in politics, or at least a role in defining again on what uh, foundations the nation uh, should be built. As we see now in uneasy or even hidden syntony with democratic rules and practices, and uh, arguably uh, the most visible case here would be Brazil uh, since the uh, um, assuming of office of President Bolsonaro. So uh, again, not so in Costa Rica. What in this context would you see as the key factors of the sustained strength of, but also challenges for democracy in Costa Rica? And uh, will, in your opinion, the demilitarized quality of the Costa Rican state and nation endure in the uh, coming period? Thank you very much uh, uh, for, your, uh, uh, for your presentation and lecture. Thank you so much, Professor Case Konings, for all these important questions. I counted around seven. I'm not so sure. Um, I saw also <laughs> uh, Dr. They Smith. can be safely ignored. <laughs> yeah, but I saw uh, also Lee, uh, Luis Guillermo taking notes. Um, let me just check, uh, because we could now continue also with, um, with um, uh, words by uh, Professor Kruid. Or if you prefer, Guillermo Solis, I first gave you a chance to answer a few of the points already raised. What is your preference? No, I, I don't have any preference, uh, uh, Professor Hagenboom. I, I think we can we can go with with Professor Kracht, Kracht and and uh, and then I'll you know try to make a summary. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very well. Okay. So, uh, dear Kruid, there you yeah. are. Yes. Yes. Um, Thank you, Dr. Solis. Thank you, Ambassador Banners. Uh, it is always a pleasure uh, to, to be uh, or to stay in the contact of Costa Rica, where I spent four, four years of my life. Uh, thank you also, uh, Barbara, for the invitation. Uh, well, after this uh, very significant presentation of, of, of Dr. Solis and the fine comments of, of uh, my friend and colleague, Case Konings, I hope to make another point. And if I and should I have to 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 give a title, uh, it would be the armed forces nobody wants. Uh, the other extreme point of the 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 the, the, the process of demilitarization, de uh, and uh, I refer to the case of over militarization and significant rural expansion in the three. All back countries, Cuba, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. I refer to the osmosis between the armed forces, the management of the economy, the management of the public sector, and the political establishment. But it is widely known, 
President Hugo Chavez and President Fidel Castro initiated a relationship of, of mutual benefits, Cuban doctors, Cuban dentists, uh, Cuban paramedics, literal, literacy trainers, educational experts, uh, military experts, intelligence experts, and even bodyguards uh, in exchange for generous all deliveries uh, at preferential uh, rates. Uh, for instance, in 2013, at the year of Chavez's death, the, the number of Cuban experts uh, had been increased to 50,000. Uh, the relation had been formalized, as well known, uh, by the establishment of the ALBA, the Alianza Boliviana uh, para los Pueblos de Nuestra América. But subsequently, the ALBA began to incorporate other countries like uh, Bolivia in 2006, Nicaragua in 2007, uh, Honduras in 2008, Ecuador in, two Ecuador in 2009, and six other Caribbean island states. But with respect to the armed forces in the ALBA countries, there is a strange phenomenon. Uh, either the military stage a coup or tried to do it twice, uh, all the military institutions as such became deeply in, entwined with the government and the public sector. Cuba and Nicaragua have armies or originated in the restructuring of former guerrilla forces. The Cuban army was substantially uh, enhanced and trained by the Soviet Union, and from the mid-60s, uh, it had uh, the formal structure of the Ministry of Defense, uh, MINFAR, and for the army, the Navy, the Air, uh, the, uh, and the Air Force, and the Ministry of the Interior, uh, meaning for the special forces for domestic use, the police and the intelligence structures. Sandinista and Nicaragua uh, in fact copied most of the Cuban structures by Cuban missions uh, 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 and high-ranking Cuban uh, military and intelligence officials. The frequency of the coups and in, in, in coup efforts in, in Venezuela, in Honduras, Ecuador and Bolivia can explain at least in part uh, by the fact that these countries were uh, when they joined the, the ALBA, uh, had Western style armies with a long tradition of anti communism in Latin America, and that produced deep fractures uh, in society and also within the armed forces. Uh, uh, the economic elites being alarmed of far going reforms or even violent revolution. Uh, Venezuela faced a coup in 2002 and, and a failed coup effort in 2019, Honduras in 2009, Bolivia in 2008 and 2000, uh, and, 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 and a successful coup in 2019, only during the police revol revolt in Ecuador in, two, in Ecuador in 2010, the military acted conformally uh, according to the uh, constitutional obligation liberating the president. The core countries of the, the Alba group are Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Cuba's economy, society, and political structure is characterized by a Spartan, hierarchical, and austere command structure, and it is modeled by two military bodies, the charismatic Fidel Castro and the brilliant army organizer, Raul Castro, who at age 26 had become the commander of the armed forces uh, in 1959 and took over the presidency in 2006 uh, after uh, 47 years of army command. He administered the country as he had done in the army, taciturn, prudent, slowly reforming, but basically maintaining the basic machinery of state and economy intact. Uh, some characteristics. All male higher functionary have been army officers, conscripted or professional. The army is self-sufficient in terms of food provision, the management of the military industry and the important tourist industry and the important uh, joint venture mega enterprise with foreign capital. President Diaz Canel had been schooled during 10 years uh, by his 
predecessor, Minister President Marrero is a retired colonel with a background in tourism as manager of the military and entrepreneurial complex Gaviota and uh, during uh, 30 years has been the Minister of Tourism. Four army officers are a member of the Bureau Politico uh, and in key post of the party, the state council and the public administration. Very probably the extended role of the armed forces will be continued. Venezuela is another example of a slow but steady, what I call, ingrowing process of the military in the public administration, the government and the economy. After the coup effort of 2002, Chavez purged the military. The new Fuerza Armada Nacional Boliviana uh, became the executive instrument of the president who also organized his sympathizers in a political party, in militias, in trade unions, and 30,000 neighborhood associations. After the purges, the new officer corps comprised extremely loyal flag and middle ranking officers. Junior officers and even NCOs that were promoted received military and ideological training in the new military academy. He also created a system of citizens militias in 2015. There were 365, 56, 60, uh, 65,000 persons organized in uh, 100 zones of Zonas de Defensa Integral, directly related to the president as the fifth wing of the armed forces, in addition to the army, the navy, the air force, and the national guard. Maduro had to deal uh, with an overwhelming economic crisis and hyperinflation. The massive out-migration process reduced the national population. Uh, I reviewed the, the, the recent numbers of the UNHCR uh, in September of this year. According to the uh, uh, UNHCRs, the number of Venezuelan migrants worldwide is 5.6 million uh, in September of this year, of which 4.6 million are in Latin America. A divided opposition and massive but unorganized wave of process did Maduro even intensify the assistance of the military. Under Maduro, the armed forces became both the, the right hand in terms of defense and management and the left hand in terms of control and repression of the president. Maduro also developed a new loyalty program for the military, mass promotion, for instance, by promoting uh, uh, 183 officers to the rank of general admiral or, or, or admiral uh, uh, in 2018. Chavez had year for year appointed a new Minister of Defense, but Maduro appointed uh, General Vladimiro Padrino as Minister of Defense in 2014, uh, a position he still occupies. In general, the military top brass is, uh, are deeply embedded in the government. In September uh, of this year, 2021, Maduro even expanded the number of flag officers to 10 military ministers in key positions of the Minister of the Presidential Office, of Defense, of the Interior, of Agriculture, of Food Provision, of Housing, of Public Works, of Electric Energies, of Front Affairs, and a new Minister of Mining and Ecological Development. The Minister of Defense is also the first vice president of uh, the sector called uh, Political Sovereignty, Security and Peace. This colleague of the interior is the vice president of the sector of citizens security, while the Minister of Energy uh, oversees as, again, a, a vice president, the sector of public board and services. And then I comment and, and, and then I closing. Uh, Nicaragua is another uh, case of military road extension, but in another sense, by doing nothing, uh, by refusing to act, then they were worried about their uh, pension fund, for instance, two times. They uh, invited the, 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 the president for a discussion about the state of affairs. This time uh, in 2018, uh, they were silent. Uh, the armed forces in, uh, were created in, 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 in 
1979 as the own branch of the Victoria uh, guerrilla, uh, created as the con conventional army to confront a possible invasion by the United States. But with the emergence of the Contra forces in 84, the army became engaged in counterinsurgency warfare, but they did during the 80s. It won the war, but it was a Pyrrhic uh, uh, victory against all odds. The party lost the presidential elections of 1990. Uh, of 1990. During the transition negotiated, uh, the army remained intact, but it was strongly uh, reduced from uh, 105 uh, thousand soldiers in 86 to 15,000 effective this year. Then Daniel Ortega and his wife and his uh, uh, chief of staff, Rosario Murillo, won the presidential elections in 2007. Uh, things changed. The Ortega and Murillo couple slowly but surely acquired more and more political control and ensured the expansion of the family business conglomerate as well. Ortega appointed trusted General Julio Aviles, already, already a senior general uh, in 2010, as the permanent uh, army chief, uh, well, the permanency of the Minister of Defense in Cuba and Venezuela, but also in Nicaragua striking. In 2018, uh, Ortega appointed his co-father-in-law, Francisco Diaz, as the Director General of the National Police. In 2017, uh, his wife, Rosaria Murillo, was sworn in as vice president. The accumulation of political and economic power in the Ortega Murillo government after 2018 opted for a continuous repression. Uh, but it is only in name, not a dictatorship. In, and that is my final observation. In April 2018, a civilian revolt. Uh, was brutally repressed by a total of at least two, 300 persons. Armed forces did not participate in the bloodshed, but watched in the sideline. The neutrality, the neutrality of the armed forces ended the high regards that the army had, be, had had in the public opinion. In terms of economy, the, army, the army's pension fund is secularized, and it makes the army a silent supporter of the Ortego Thank you very much, dear Kruid. Um, yes, I think we were starting with the exceptional position of Costa Rica, but I think from what you exposed also, we see how some other exceptional cases and, and trying to kind of navigate a little bit our understanding of the role of military throughout the region. Um, yeah, your, your words also very much help us to get a sense of what's going on. Um, now there's the challenge for uh, former president uh, Solis to, uh, well, pick at least some of those uh, interesting questions and, and points made by Professor Konings and Kruid, uh, respond to that or philosophize on that if, if you haven't had as much time yet to think about them. But I think there's sufficient food for thought and discussion. Uh, in the meantime, while um, uh, Luis Suiz has the word, um, other people, if they have a question, if they feel some important issue has not yet been brought up about our, by our two discussants, um, or you like to hear more uh, from uh, Solis about what he was talking about, you can put a topic already in the chat if you like. I will open up the floor uh, later on for your uh, for your questions. So, um, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much to our distinguished commentators for their very insightful presentations. Um, about Dr. Kreik's uh, presentation, I would like to say that precisely not having got, uh, regimes like the ones he analyzed is one of the benefits of not having an armed force. We don't have to worry about that kind of uh, regime uh, developing. Um, but I'm not trying to be facetious. It's just a matter of you know, the, the, the reality check of armies involved in politics in Latin America is pretty, pretty dire. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a temptation that we have been kept at bay simply by not having the, the, uh, the armed forces there. And this leads me to uh, Professor Koenig's uh, 
observations and questions, I would like to address them very briefly. And I apologize for this because they would entail, they, they should, uh, should, should bring a, a, more, a more profound analysis on my part, but in the interests of time. Um, wh why is it, he asks correctly, that Costa Rica having had the same weak armies than other countries of the same region, was able to abolish them and, uh, and the other countries did not. Um, well, I, I think that the, there are three elements that, that can be uh, pointed at. Uh, first of all is the question, question of in, in institutionalization. I think this is very fundamental. Costa Rica was able to develop institutions that made or rendered the armed forces unnecessary for the purposes they have been used for in other countries. In other words, that's one thing. I mean, we, we have institutions that are strong, credible and legitimate, which are part of the constitutional order that um, allow for the country to, to stay away from the facto or the intervention of armies. Because, and here's the second thing, uh, armies in, in many countries in Latin America, including several Latin Central American countries, if not all, have been used not to protect these countries against foreign armies or foreign threats, but against their own citizens. In, in other words, they have worked almost as an internal super police force. Okay? Remember that in the 1930s, the United States created these armies as constabularies, which were you know, a sort of carabinieri model where of, of a militarized police, then they became, you know, fully Cold War armies. But the, the, the idea that the armed forces are only supposed to defend sovereignty against external threats have not worked. And actually one of the few attempts uh, that we made in Central America to uh, push the armed forces in that direction was the constitution of the Tratado Centroamericano de Seguridad Democrática, the Democratic Security Treaty that was signed in 1995, which of course has not been implemented fully. And, and, and the, the most uh, persuasive supporter of that treaty was a former president of Honduras. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's something that, that one would like to 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 see you know and 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 it unfortunately as professor cunnings has has mentioned the uh, presence of in, transnational organized crime in central america in the 1990s and the year 2000s uh, justified or gave an excuse for many governments to get the army involved in fighting against against uh, transnational organized crime, particularly narco trafficking, arguing that the police forces were already taken over by the, the, the narcos, that they were complicit with narco trafficking. So this was you know, a reinforcement of that idea. Communism was no longer, but now international organized crime was the new enemy. And, and this I think has been pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Um, so why was Figueres allowed? by the United States or capable of convincing the United States, whatever reading you want to do, um, by, uh, of abolishing the armed, armed forces. Well, first of all, uh, the United States was mostly uh, worried, concerned in the 19, late 1940s and 50s. And this is the reason why they ultimately uh, intervened in Guatemala, toppling a democratically elected government in 1954 with communism. And Jose Figueres was clearly an anti-communist. Uh, he, uh, upon winning the war that was fought against the government and its communist allies, he actually expelled the uh, exile, sent the communist leadership to exile. And that was, was not going to be, but the first of a very clear uh, positioning of Costa Rica within the Western world, the Western visions. There was no, no way anybody could have said that Figueres was playing with the, uh, with the then Soviet Union. Uh, Cuba was not around, of course, but that there was a, a, a threat of the Soviet Union recreating a revolutionary government in, in Costa Rica. That was not the case. Figueres was very clear. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, he ensured that his reforms were going to be successful. I mean, by contrast, let's, uh, let's recall what happened in Guatemala, where forced by the opposition and by the presence of American agents, 
uh, president, uh, the, the, the president of Guatemala, Arbenz, seeked support from the Czech Republic to provide weapons, which gave added uh, reason to the United States that he was, you know, in the hands of the, of the Russians. So this is something that, that Figueres clearly did. That's one reason. And the other one is that Costa Rica had no strategic assets for the United States. I mean, it was a country that they could use actually as a, as a, as a window of democratic, uh, democratic uh, rule. And the model that Figueres was developing was the same one that the United States used itself after the, the, the 1929, 1930, 31 crisis, which was the welfare state. So, you know, it was very easy for the United States to understand that the Costa Rican way was an acceptable way, was different from the others in which, you know, the lack of institutions, poverty, uh, the, in the case of El Salvador, let's remember the 1932 upheaval of Farabundo Martí, um, was was handled in such a way that it was read in the United States as uh, as something requiring their attention. Um, so you know this support to the U.S. and anti-communism, I think, was a very important thing. Um, yes, we're having issues with uh, the police force in Costa Rica that needs to be constantly. Um, I don't know if it updated is the is the word, but has to be. Uh, reviewed to attend these uh, new issues that we have um, that unfortunately are not necessarily the ones that uh, were in the past. So our police forces, what the constitutional article 12 uh, in, indicates should be sufficient is something that, um, that can create challenges for the country. Uh, I, I still believe that we have room to very, um, profoundly upgrade and change the structure of the police force. A number of reforms have been taken. For example, during the second mandate, President Oscar Arias uh, changed the whole um, scale of names and to, to, to make our police look like, not as a, a constabulary, because we have kept the ranks of our military uh, and the nom military nomenclature for our police forces after 1949, well, that was changed. So instead of having colonels and lieutenants and captains and majors, now we had agent one, agent two, you know, police uh, chief and, and, and that kind of nomenclature, which created uh, sort of some resistance uh, among the police force. But clearly that is one of the bigger concerns. So I'm gonna leave it there. I'm sorry I was not uh, extensive, but um, but in, 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 uh, in the hope that we will have some participation from the audience. Uh, I, uh, I apologize and leave it, leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you managed to cover quite a few of the questions indeed. Um, and yes, let us open up to see what other questions there are uh, among our audience. Um, so let us stop the recording.